quote, reducing immigration levels is a necessary part of population stabilization and the drive towards sustainability, end quote. But most environmentalists have not stepped forward to back up those statements with action. There are fears that asking Congress for reductions in immigration might cause them to be criticized as mean-spirited. That's why so many environmentalists across the country have pulled resources to distribute this tape. The presentation by Roy Beck that you're about to see uh, is the most uh, dramatic demonstration of the uh, implications of continued uh, population increase and the contribution uh, made to that increase by our uh, huge immigration rate. Uh, I think that this issue is the, the issue of population is the most important environmental issue that we as a nation face. The key factor in this immigration issue is the numbers. The fact that Americans are concerned about immigration today is not because Americans have suddenly become more mean-spirited or that they've even changed that much. What's changed is the numbers of immigrants. Now listen to these numbers. In the 40 years prior to 1965, we had an average of 178,000 immigrants per year. Now I call that the golden era of immigration because I can find no time in history when immigrants were so welcomed, when they assimilated so quickly, or when they did so well. Because we had lower immigration, we had a tighter labor market, which means that we had the pressure on more capital investment, we had pressure for uh, higher productivity and higher wages. And because of that, we became a middle class society during that golden era of immigration. And what's really wonderful about the golden era of immigration is that it's the only time in American history that there was a, a sustained significant increase in the income of black Americans, and that increase was even faster than the increase for white Americans. Tight labor markets, the best friend that any worker ever had. But in 1965, Congress changed the immigration law and inadvertently sent the numbers skyrocketing. Between 1965 and 1989, we averaged more than 500,000 immigrants a year. Nearly every aspect of American society has changed because of that rapid increase. The polls show us that uh, between 70 and 80 percent of Americans say immigration ought to be cut. And yet, Americans have not really spoken out that much about legal immigration. And I think the reason is, is because most of us have immigrant friends. We don't want to talk about things that would uh, hurt the feelings of our immigrant friends. And we certainly would not want to say anything or do anything that would bring hostility uh, toward the foreign born among us. The polls show that Americans um, believe that immigrants are hardworking, family loving people. They like immigrants. So what we have right now is a country in which Americans are pro-immigrant but anti-immigration. I find that people get angry when they see what I'm about to show you. And what I ask people, and I ask you is, if you get angry, don't get angry at immigrants. If you're angry, the place to put your anger is on public officials who have set immigration numbers without regard to their effect on the American people. Now in the 90s, and let's just take a look, one more look at this, immigration is running at more than 800,000 per year. Why are Americans so concerned about immigration today? It's because the numbers have overwhelmed them. I'm about to show you some charts that should be the centerpiece of any discussion on immigration. No congressional action should occur without consulting these charts. In 1970, we had 203 million people in this country. Those people would be represented below this chart. What this chart shows you, what this green shows you, is the growth in the U.S. population since 1970. In 1973, the American people move to a below replacement level fertility. That means that we have on average fewer than 2.1 children per woman. At below replacement fertility, we will eventually stabilize our population along with all the rest of the advanced nations of the world. Um, but we still had growth. This is the growth of births over deaths. And the reason is, is that the baby boomers, and I'm at the first of that bulge, we had to move through our childbearing years. So even though we had small families, there were so many of us that we kept growing. 
So in fact, this country, 30 years after it decided it had to restore and protect the environment, was added over 30 million more people that we had to deal with for air pollution, water pollution. We had to build the schools. We had to provide the infrastructure. We had a lot of population growth since 1970. Demographers have shown us what will happen to the 1970 stock population uh, throughout the next 50 years. And that is, they took the people who were here in 1970, subtracted the deaths of those people, added their descendants, and subtracted the deaths of their descendants. And they found that this is what will happen. Now, as you can see, the population by right now is very slowly growing and in, in, in the next five years is going to stop growing. It'll grow a little bit more with the baby boom echoes echo. And then it reaches a peak, peak of 247 million in the year 2030. Stabilizes for some time and then starts to very slowly, imperceptibly really, uh, to decline. This is not a zero immigration level, however. This is replacement level immigration. That is, Replacement level fertility is when you have the same number of people being born as are dying each year. Replacement level immigration is when you have the same number of people coming in as leave each year. Right now, about 200,000 Americans leave the country permanently each year. This is what the Census Bureau tells us actually happened in the last 20, 25 years. Now, as you can see, our population growth has doubled over what it otherwise would have. This red represents every immigrant who came since 1970 plus their descendants minus the deaths of both groups there's been as much population growth from immigration as from the natural growth from the 1970 stock population now that has meant that we've had to double all of the additional infrastructure expenditures we've had in this country. We've had to build twice as many schools, twice as many sewage treatment plants. We've had to build twice as many roads and streets. All of the needs of this country have, the additional needs of this country, have doubled because of this radical new immigration policy of the United States government. In California, the State Department of Education has found that they have to build an entire elementary school every single day of the year a new school every single day of the year in perpetuity as long as the current immigration continues at this level just to keep up with the children being added by immigration. So what does Congress have in store for us right now? Well, the U.S. Census Bureau tells us that if Congress does not lower the level of immigration that we have right now, we will be looking at a future that looks like this. As you can see, the numbers go completely off the charts. The Census Bureau tells us that this will be our future if immigration continues at today's rates. And this is what we're bequeathing to our children and our grandchildren by the middle of the next century. This is not conjecture, this is not subjective, this is not what might be, this is what will be if Congress refuses to lower immigration to something like a traditional level. If at this level of population, 40% of the lakes and streams in this country still are not fishable and swimmable, what are we going to do here, there, all the way up there? If Americans are beginning to fight over the opportunity to be in parks, on beaches, the national parks are being loved to death at this population in the country, what happens up here? If we are not keeping up with the education of our urban school children at this level, if we cannot build schools fast enough now, if so many Americans are feeling that the congestion and the, so the tearing of the social fabric is, is moving beyond acceptability at this level, what is our hope moving on up. Now you may live in a community that's little affected by immigration, but believe me, if this growth happens, there isn't a community in America that is assured of escaping the ravages that's now hitting California. And we must 
make decisions now for our children and our grandchildren's future. If we allow this to happen, that future will be foreclosed. Now, what can we do? It's very simple. Congress merely has to lower the number back to where it was in 1965, back to the golden era of immigration, below 200,000. Now, what would, what would that look like? Well, it would not end the growth. I can tell you that. The Census Bureau says that if we were to lower immigration from the more than a million of today to a zero net level, which would be about 200,000, we would immediately slow the pace of growth and get some relief. The real improvement, though, would come for our grandchildren who would see a stabilizing of the population by around 2050. The wonderful thing is, is that we are not way up there at almost 400 million in 2050, headed to 500 million. The bad news for us is that if you have lived in an area of high growth and you know all of the urban sprawl, all of the lost farmland, all of the drained wetlands, lost habitat, the loss of biodiversity that we've had in the last 25 years, we are going to have all of that again before we finally peak in 2050. But that's probably, I'm afraid, the best we can do. Every year we w delay, the, the peak will be higher. There are some Americans who have very sincere feelings that we have to bring in immigrants in order to show our concern for the third world. Is immigration an effective tool? In this illustration, I use this gumball as representing about one million people. Now, one million people is about what we take in a year in, in immigrants. This is not a small number because, remember, this one gumball worth of, of, of immigration is driving every bit of this red. And each year, in our magnanimity, we try to rescue about this number from third world poverty. But how many people in the world are equally deserving of this kind of humanitarian concern on our part? Well, you've got to have some kind of benchmark, and I use Mexico. 25% of the immigrants in the 1980s came from Mexico. Depending on the value of the peso at the time, the average Mexican makes about one-tenth the amount of money that the average American makes. That's poor. I would say that's deserving of our compassion. But how many people in the world are more impoverished than the average Mexican? And the answer is 4,600 million people. 4.6 billion people in the world are more impoverished than the average Mexican. If immigration is a policy to help the people of the third world, I want you to watch very closely. Don't miss this. Because I want you to watch to see how much the third world changes each year when we take the million people out of it. You see, there can never be any hope for the people in the third world except here where they live. Most of these people, 99 point whatever percent of these people can never leave. They're stuck where they are. They have to bloom where they're planted. If we care about these people, we have to figure out ways to help them here. Because we can do this kind of thing forever, but we won't make any difference in the world. There are many ways that Americans can help third world nations, but immigration is not one of them. And let's look at another issue here. It's that, that's the issue of the safety valve. Since the 1950s, people have been talking about how the United States has to take the overpopulation of the Latin American countries, lest those countries blow up. Can that work? Well, no, it can't. Let me show you why. The fact is, is that last year, we took about a million people. But last year, the third world added births over deaths, another 80 million people into the impoverished persons of the world. And this year, we'll take a million people. And this year, the third world will add more than 80 million more people. And next year, if the U.S. government insists on bringing this exorbitant, non-traditional level of immigration and brings another one million people, these people will still add another more than 80 million people into the impoverished numbers of the world. There's no way that we can ever get ahead of this. We cannot be a safety valve. We could take 
millions a year, totally destroy the social fabric of this country, totally destroy the environmental resources, ruin any possibility of the lower skilled people in this country having any kind of a decent standard of living, we still would not get ahead of this. If we want to help the third world, immigration is meaningless. The most important thing we can do is answer the requests of third world nations that have been begging us for years to help them with family planning assistance. We have been enriched by so many immigrants who have brought tremendous skills into this country, and we're thankful for those. The question is, though, should we continue to drain off large numbers of skilled professional people from the other countries? Because you see, 25% of the people who come in this country are the people who could be the great agronomists, engineers, teachers, public health people, public administrators, uh, who perhaps could do something here. If I were a person in some of those countries and had a chance to move here instead of staying here, I have no idea what I would do. This is not a moral judgment on the people who come here. It's a moral judgment on us and asking the question, do we continue to drain the most professional, brightest people from the rest of the world? Do we continue to drain the change agents? The time to act is now. Americans must contact their senators and their U.S. representatives, ask them to act immediately to bring down immigration, back down to a level when immigration was a nourishing stream instead of a rampaging river.